Thank you for the ministry and music this morning. Glad to see you here at church. Thanks for joining us online again. If you have your Bibles open to Esther and the fourth chapter, Esther and the fourth chapter, as we continue our series on Esther, the story, a sermon from the book of Esther, in, the, in our theme this year, in I Believe God. I want to look at this morning, the right response in a difficult time. The right response in a difficult time. Have you ever had a difficult time in your life? How many with a raised hand at home or here would say, yes, Pastor Howell, I've at least one time in my life, at least once, had a difficult time in my life. Who would say, if they're going to be real honest, I've had more than one. Okay, fair enough. We've all had difficult times. And there are different levels of difficulty. And usually our difficulties seem greater to us than someone else's difficulties seem to us. If I stub my toe and you hurt yourself, I feel my toe that I've stubbed more than you may feel what you're going through. It's how our bodies work. We have to fight that calamity, that that mindset. That's what the Bible teaches us to bear one another's burdens. But we've all been through difficult times and unfortunately, not everyone responds the same during difficult times or the right way during difficult times. Would you agree with that? There is a show on TV called Jeopardy. Maybe you've heard of that unfamiliar show. In that show, there will be an answer, and then you have to pose the, your response in the form of a question. If I had to re, uh, put another name for this sermon, I would say it this way, I'll take overreactions for 500. Maybe you've seen people with Overreact, who have overreacted. Uh, a little while back, I was on an airplane a year and a half ago or so. I have noise-canceling headphones and had these headphones on. I was sitting on the aisle of a, 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 of a, um, the aisle of uh, the end of an aisle on a row. These noise-canceling headphones cancel about all of life at that time. And usually, I get an airplane, I put them on and then just, you know, tune out of everything else going on. Crying children, safety announcements. It doesn't matter at that point. All right, headphones are on and I'm locked and loaded. So I was slightly like, what's going on when I heard some noise, some uh, hullabaloo coming through over the noise-canceling headphones? So now I open my eyes, and I'm like, what is going on that I can hear above these noise-canceling headphones? It's a pretty nice set, and they do a pretty good job. And my attention is directed to two young men who are sitting in an exit row, one aisle in front of me, and there's just two seats, and they're right next to each other. And they're in an argument. And it is a loud argument. Maybe you've heard people argue loudly. We're in a confined space. Well, I'm watching them and they're exercised and I can't really hear besides this rah, 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 rah. So I'm like, now I'm kind of intrigued, right? I'm woken back up, so I might as well see what's going on. So I take off my headphones and I'm I'm bombarded by this noise. They're, They're quite loud, actually, quite exercised calling each other a whole bunch of names, ones I cannot repeat in church this morning, very angry at each other. And about that time, the stewardess, the flight attendant, comes up and she says, well, sir, what's to be a problem? And the one gentleman looks at the other and goes, I want to move out of my seat right now. I'm like, wow, you know, this is a way to get upgraded. This is a good, a good method. And she's trying to fuse the situation and, and come to find out, uh, in the course of the conversation, the offense was stated. Why this man wanted to move so badly. And it was two offenses, actually. One, he said the man next to him stunk. And he touched the armrest. And because this other first man touched the armrest, it now, I guess, emboldened the second man to yell, to scream, to raise his voice. I'll take over reactions for 500. Now, I don't like my armrest being touched in the car, much less an airplane. But I don't get to yell and scream because of that. Do you? Another time I was in an airplane, and there was a man in the back of the plane who would not sit down. He began to get very exercised in his his unwillingness to sit down. And pretty soon, two police officers came and escorted him off the airplane. As they're escorting him off the airplane, he's like, I'll sit down now, I'll sit down now. And as they walked past me, one of the officers said, Sir, it is too late for that now. I don't know what caused them to have a reaction, but I do know that it's a fact of life that if we're not careful, 
We will not respond the way we ought to respond when difficulty comes. We're going to face difficulty in our life. Jesus says that is a fact. The question this morning is, how do you respond? How do I respond when faced with difficulty? We would look at this account, will you please, in Esther the chapter number 4. We're going to see some different responses. Some right, some need adjustment. Chapter, in verse number 1 of chapter 4, the Bible says, When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud, voice, loud and a bitter cry. And came even before the king's gate, for none might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Lord, I thank you for this passage of scripture. Lord, as we look at it, would you open our hearts and our minds to the truth from your word? Lord, we're going to face things that are difficult in our life. But Lord, we want to face them with your grace and your strength and have the right reaction, the right mindset. Lord, teach us this morning. Use me as I speak. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here in the auditorium or under the sound of my voice who has never trusted you as a Savior, that they would do that today. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Just to remind us kind of the background in this story, the decree from Haman, with the king's signet, has now been published in every province across all the territory that Ahasuerus, King Ahasuerus, controls. The decree goes basically like this. On a certain day of the month, you have the ability to destroy and kill and wipe out any Jew that you know. And if you do that... Anything that they own, you get to keep. You would wonder that now neighbors, we put it against neighbors. You can imagine what that would have felt like as a Jew during that time. Young, old, man, woman, child, if you were a Jew, the decree said you could be destroyed killed. What a terrible decree. A heinous decree. A hideous decree. It's awful. Can you imagine receiving and hearing that decree? Sometimes we read these Bible accounts and we don't put ourselves there. We kind of read them with an overarching like, oh, that's interesting. But can you imagine walking through a town square and all of a sudden hearing those words? As a husband, you quickly take your wife and three children home with you. You would fear for your life. You'd fear for the life of your spouse, fear for the life of your children. What would your response be if you heard that decree? We've had difficult times like we all acknowledged, but I don't believe any of us have heard that decree before. Nothing that would measure up to that level of difficulty in our lives. Where the power in charge of that known ruling country at that time says, listen, they're fair game. What an incredibly difficult time. What a hard time. What could they do? How would you respond? I look at now some of the responses when people disagree. They yell, they rant. Blow things up on social media. Sometimes they refuse to follow. But how should a Christian respond? Believe it or not, the world's not getting any better. Right? It's not becoming more conducive to be a Christian now than it was 10 years ago. Our times will only become more difficult the longer we live. Right Now we pray for revival, but until the end of the world, it's not going to get better. Jesus said it only gets worse till the end. It's going to get more difficult. So how is a Christian supposed to respond? I would say this this morning. In the midst of trying circumstances, we are called to respond in faith. 
Now look this morning what happened in this account, and I think we'll pull out some, some things that will be helped to us. I look at, first of all, the mourning. I see Mordecai, verses 1 through 3, we read that. He perceived what was done, and he had a humble cry. He rent his clothes, and it happened throughout all the provinces, wherever the decree was, was stated, wherever it was proclaimed. Mordecai went to a particular action that was common among the Jewish culture and religion where if you were in an intense sorrow and wanted to beseech the face of God, you would humble yourself uh, and they would do some things on the exterior. They would rend their clothes, sackcloth and ashes, and often put ashes on their head to show that they were in a humble place. There was mourning among Mordecai, mourning among the Jews. And the Bible says when Mordecai, verse number one, perceived all that was done. You see, in the end of chapter three, we know what Haman said. We know how he went to the king. Mordecai would have known that. We get the bird's eye view from the Holy Spirit, a wonderful bird's eye view. Mordecai did not have that bird's eye view. But he was able to perceive all that was done. And he, I'm assuming, realized that Haman was so antagonistic and so angry, he was not content just to harm Mordecai. He wanted to wipe out everyone who would be associated with Mordecai. And Mordecai rent his clothes. He had told the servants we looked at last week, he told them not why he was, why he was not bowing down. He just said this, I am a Jew. I am a Jew. Basically saying, I have a different God, I have a different religion, I have a different spiritual father. And we need to be prepared sometimes to suffer for who we are. We will suffer sometimes for being a Christian. You may not realize this, but being a Christian is not necessarily a popular viewpoint in the world. Having absolute truth is not popular to have a standard. And, and listen, this is not because I want it to be truth. It is truth. Whether I want it to or not, it is truth. Whether I believe it or not, this is truth. God is truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We'll look at that tonight in the sermon in 1 John. This is truth. That's not popular. All right, this is not always popular in my life. This steps all over me sometimes. The Bible does. It's still truth whether I like it or not. Be prepared to suffer. Sometimes for who we are, who you are, there was a humble cry. There was a helpless cry, I see. Mordecai and the Jews began to mourn in sackcloth and ashes. You'd have to think, what options did they have? This was sealed with the king's signet. We'll look at it in the upcoming weeks. But it is the law of the Medes and Persians that once a law, a law is written, it cannot be altered. We don't have that same idea in America. Raw laws can be written and rewritten and reinterpreted every single day, depending on what court or what judge you go before. Right? I'm like, can I get an amen? This happens, right? Not so in this culture. When that was stated, whether right or wrong, whether, uh, whether it was legitimate or not, when that law was sealed, with King Ahasuerus' signet ring, it was now unchangeable. It wouldn't have mattered if they'd gone to beseech the face of the king. King, change the law. I can't change it. It is sealed with the king's signet ring. It's not fair, King Ahasuerus. It doesn't matter. I cannot change the, the, the writing of the law. So much so that at the end of the story when Esther comes, their law is not rewritten. Another law is written. All right, but this law would stand, could not be changed. So it was a helpless cry. They, they didn't have an option. They couldn't appeal the law. They could not sue the king. They had no options. It was helpless. And sometimes in our life, in difficult times, we are nothing but helpless. You've been there before? There's enough problems we solve ourselves without God's help. Work a little bit longer. Work a little bit harder. Think a little bit more. But God has a way of bringing you and me to a point of helplessness before Him. Where there are no options. Nothing that you or I can do. No way to solve it. No YouTube video. No amount of overtime. Nothing will solve it. Except His power. There was a humble cry, but there was a helpless cry. 
See, there's a phrase that Christians and non-Christians will use. Many people think it's in the Bible, but it's not. It's this phrase, God helps them who help themselves. All right? Now, you may have heard that phrase before, but just so you know, it's not in God's Word. God has a way of bringing us to a point of helplessness. Helplessness is endemic to human existence. Helplessness can come from financial setbacks or professional setbacks or, or health setbacks. The feeling of helplessness can come from sudden or chronic illness, from attack from a burglar or by someone you love. Everyone, given enough time, is given and knows a feeling of helplessness. Remember when our second son, James, was very young and got pretty sick. Took him to the emergency room and ended up going to the, the pediatric unit at, at, at Covenant. He was about two years old at that time, if I remember correctly, on, on his age. And I remember the helpless feeling when your son's hooked up to an IV at two years old. Nothing as a father that I can do except pray. Nothing that I, no way I can solve it. I'm not a doctor. I can Google whatever, but that's all it is. I don't even know how to adjust the, uh, the little machine there. I'd make a mess of it. Helplessness. But then I see not only the morning, I see another problem. I see a misunderstanding. Look with me in, in uh, if you would, in verse 4. So Esther, maids or chamberlains, came and told it to her. So Esther's inside the palace. Or she's inside the, the king's complex. She didn't know what was going on necessarily. And, and she heard that Mordecai was mourning through her, through her chamberlains. And they said, hey, these Jews are mourning. Mordecai is out there. Then was the king exceedingly grieved. And she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him. But he received it not. You see, uh, uh, there was some confusion. Esther sent some raiment, but Mordecai didn't answer. He just didn't receive it. So then called, verse 5, then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains whom he had appointed to attend unto her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So she, she didn't know what was going on at that point. She knew that Mordecai, her uncle, all right, and most likely the other servants did not know that there was a connection there. Remember, because, because she had not told the king, like Mordecai had told her not to, that she was a Jew. So they must have known that she knew Mordecai, but not that she was related to him. And, and she says, uh, what's going on out there? And this guy that, that I know, he's, he's weeping by the king's gate. He's mourning. He's in sackcloth and ashes. And so she says, what's going on? And she wants to clarify. There was some confusion. And then she, she wants some clarification. Verse 6, so Hatak went forth to Mordecai into the king's street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him, of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. And Hagtech came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. You see, Esther didn't understand what was going on. There was a misunderstanding. She sent him some clothes to Mordecai. Hey, you know, whatever you're doing, put these clothes on. And he says, no. She's like, well, why? Why not? See, sometimes in our difficulties, we are misunderstood. I read this kind of humorous misunderstanding. This happens sometimes. On Monday in the paper... It said this, the Reverend A.J. Jones has one color TV set for sale. Telephone 626-1313 after 7 p.m. and ask for Mrs. Donnelly, who lives with him, cheap. This was Tuesday's adjustment. We regret any embarrassment caused to Reverend Jones by a typographical error in yesterday's paper. The ad should have read, the Reverend A.J. Jones has one color TV set for sale. Cheap. Telephone 626-1313 and ask for Mrs. Donnelly, who lives with him after 7 p.m. <laughs> Wednesday, there was an update. The Reverend A.J. Jones informs us that he has received several annoying telephone calls because of an incorrect ad in yesterday's paper. It should have read, 
the Reverend A.J. Jones has one color TV set for sale cheap. Telephone 626-1313 after 7 p.m. and ask for Mrs. Donnelly, who loves to live with him. Thursdays. Please notice that I, the Reverend A.J. Jones, have no color TV set for sale. I have smashed it. Don't call 626-1313 anymore. I have not been carrying on with Mrs. Donnelly. She was, until yesterday, my housekeeper. And Friday's ad, wanted a housekeeper. Usual housekeeping duties, good pay. Reverend A.J. Jones, telephone 626-1313. Misunderstandings. They happen all the time, don't they? They happen among friends, happen among co-workers, among husband and wives, misunderstandings. And such was the case right here with Esther and Mordecai. And Esther didn't understand what Mordecai was doing. In fact, when she sent him clothes, she was telling him to stop mourning. She was saying, put these clothes on, don't mourn, don't be sad any longer. Can you imagine Mordecai? How can I not be sad? My people are about to be destroyed. How can I not be sad? The case is hope and stuff for God. How can I not be sad? There is no benefit in sight. How can I not be sad? The world, my world is coming to an end. How can I not but mourn? And you send me clothes? You send me clothes? That's not what I need. So he refused them. If you've been around church long enough, you'll find that sometimes good church people just don't know what to say. They just don't know what to say. Let me give you just a, a side note for you. If you don't know what to say, here it is, don't. If you don't know what to say, don't. I'm going to make it plain it for you. If you don't know what to say, can I say it? Shut up. There. All right, I said it. I said it in church. It's a bad word in my house, but, you know, it's not my house. It's the Lord's house. <laughs> Oh, he does say, shut up, read James. He says that. Misunderstanding. There was confusion there. There was clarification. Mordecai sent back and said, Esther, let me tell you what's going on. Hey, tech, tell her what, what happ what's happening. And here's a copy of the decree. See what we're about to face here. He says in verse number 8, he charged her that she should go into the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. Esther, you can help us. You go before the king. Help us. Boy, you would think that that would be the end of it, right? I'm the queen. You know what? Problem solved. But there's a complication. Look at verse number 10, the complication. Esther spake unto Hatech and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. She says, listen to hey, check this, this guy who's just running back and forth with messages, all right? He's back and forth and back and forth. She goes, we got a problem. All the king's servants, verse 11, and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come into the, unto the king these 30 days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. She says, there's a complication. I just can't waltz in there. Mordecai, there's a complication. I haven't been called into his presence for 30 days. She says, the way she says that 30 days, the way she mentions that is that it was an anomaly. It was different than it normally would have been. For whatever reason, whether the king was on a different business, whether the king was preoccupied with something else, he had not acknowledged the queen for 30 days. She says there's a complication. If I just show up, I may die. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read the scripture, I find humor. Remember the decree? All the Jews are going to die. Right? And Esther says, I can't go to the king because I may die. Help me here. Didn't you see it? That's what Mordecai responds, by the way. He goes, okay, he's scratching his head. But she says there's a complication. You ever thought this? Why can't the solution be an easy one? Why can't the solution be an easy one? Why can't 
Esther just waltz right in there and say, King of Hazarus, this is the way it is. Haman's over there. There's a problem. Mordecai, my uncle's out there. And so you can solve this. One, two, three. Didn't work that way. And you're going to find out in your life, sometimes the solution doesn't seem like an easy one. You think, well, God, you can make it easy. But he hasn't to make sure that we walk by faith. Look what Mordecai says in verse 13. And Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews, for thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time. Then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return to Mordecai this answer, Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai sends her a mission. He gives her the reproof. Listen, Esther, you won't escape. Don't think that you're safe because you're in the king's palace. You're not safe. This is a life and death situation. And no matter what you do, God will still deliver. No matter how you respond, God is still a good God. God is not weak when our responses are weak, though our choices affect those around us. And Esther says, pray with me. I will not walk in my faith. I will walk in my faith, not my fear. And if I perish, I perish. What's her response? I will willingly sacrifice myself. I will do whatever it takes. But as I walk this path, fast, pray for me. Let me give you three thoughts from this story. The message. First thought is this. In a difficult time, we can panic or plead. You, you look at current, current climate, we see a lot of panicking. We see a lot of panicking. I'm not saying it's an undue panic. All right, we're in a pandemic. But we as Christians have a choice. We can panic or plead. When the deck is stacked against us, we can panic or plead. When it looks like there's no way out, we can panic or plead. And I look at Mordecai and I see him pleading, not panicking. Though he is concerned, though it's helpless, he's not just run around. He goes to the one source that can do it, and that's God of the universe. We can panic or plead. And on a side note, I'm just glad that our access is never denied to the God of the universe. Our God doesn't have a golden scepter that if we approach at the wrong time, he'll, he'll let us perish. No, we can boldly approach the throne of grace. Do you panic or do you plead? We're never denied access. Make sure that prayer is your first response, not your last response. And make sure when you see someone else grieving, you don't just give them a change of clothes. We can panic or plead. Um, March 6th of 1881... A barge was wrecked off the coast of Scotland. Fishermen on the shore made several attempts to get on board, but the wind was too strong. They finally succeeded at the end to get a line across and one empty barrel. There were 11 men on board, but many were too cold and now incapable of doing much else. They got the barrel strung back and forth, and soon it became an apparatus for a traveling cage. They put one young sailor into it and then draw it back across the vast spans. They got one man across, as the story goes, as the account goes, and scarcely was he on the other side that the wind came in a fierce, uh, fierce blow and, and turned the ship a little bit and twisted the rope so that the barrel could not travel the same. All of a sudden, a man decided to try to just handhold by handhold come across. They shouted him to stop and told him it's useless, but he proceeded on. It was just a few moments with the waves beating over him as tall as houses. And the poor fellow had gone just a little distance from the ship. And then the heavy seas swept over him. He was lost in the ocean, in the surging waves. A few moments later, another wave came and the boat 
turned itself back. And the barrel was now able to travel back and forth. They quickly brought every other man across. Afterward, the captain was asked about the lost man. He said this, We tried to persuade him not to attempt such a useless task. We knew it would be impossible for him to reach the shore in that way, but he would not listen to us. A fine fellow he was, added the captain, the best man in the crew, but we lost him because he tried to save himself his own way. And all the rest were saved, but by hands other than their own. When we had a difficult time, we'll be tempted to solve it all by ourselves. Panic. We can panic or we can plead. I would encourage us to, like Mordecai, to plead, like Esther, at the end of the account, to say, you pray, you fast. When difficulty comes, do you panic or plead? Second thought is this. How you respond when you're misunderstood shows your true motives. How you respond when you're misunderstood shows your true motives. I've been misunderstood before. When I'm misunderstood, there's something inside of me, my flesh, that wants to declare what is true, what is right. Maybe you've felt this before. You've got to understand where I'm coming from. Now, I see Mordecai bringing clarification, but I don't see anger there, do you? I don't see irritation there. He was just gave the information. You've heard the old story, driving through Texas, a New Yorker, collided with a truck carrying a horse. A few months later, he tried to collect damages for his injuries. The judge, how, how can you now claim to have these injuries? According to the police report at the time, you said you were perfectly fine. And you've heard the story. The New Yorker said, well, it's like this. He said, I collided with a horse and buggy. The sheriff stopped by and he took one look at the horse and he shot him. Then he asked me how I felt. And I said, perfectly fine. One dark rainy night, a salesman had a flat tire on a lonely road. But to his dismay, he had no lug wrench. Seeing a nearby farmhouse, he set out on foot. Surely the farmer would have a lug wrench, he thought. But would he even come to the door? And if he did, he'd probably be furious at being bothered. He'd probably say, what's the big idea getting me out of bed in the middle of the night? This thought made the salesman very angry. Why, that farmer's a selfish old clod to refuse to help me. And finally, the salesman reached the house, frustrated and drenched. He banged on the door. Who's there? A voice called out from inside. You know good and well who it is, yelled the salesman. It's me, and you can keep your old lug wrench. I wouldn't borrow it if it's the last one in the country. Misunderstood. You've been misunderstood before? I have been. How do you respond? And there was a husband. He knew he wasn't that easy to get along with. So it was his 50th wedding anniversary. He sent a card to his wife with some flowers. Ordered from the floors. The card read this way. Thanks for putting up with me so long. When the wife got the delivery, she was incensed. She was angry. Just where do you think you're going, buddy, she asked. Then she read the card. Thanks for putting up with me, period. So long. How do you react when you're misunderstood? Mordecai had the right response. He said, here's where it's at. And don't think you'll escape. Last thought is this. The solution to our problems is always a matter of faith over fear. The solution to our problems is always a matter of faith over fear. We are fashioned for faith Fear is not a native land. Faith is where we breathe the oxygen of God's holy, supernatural air. Faith is like the oil that makes our life run. Fear is the sand in the machinery of our life. Fear will cause us to stop. Faith will cause us to move forward. Fear will cause us to be paralyzed. And faith will bring us power. In faith and confidence, we can breathe freely and walk in God's kingdom. We always have a choice, faith or fear. We can choose to be frozen. We can choose to ignore it, to stick our head in the sand, or we can walk in faith. 
when I read Esther's last phrase, and if I perish, I perish. I could not help but be reminded with that familiar verse in Philippians, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You see, Esther at first said, I may die. Then she walked in faith and said, if that's what it takes, that's okay. We can always choose to walk either by fear or in faith. How do you respond in difficult times? Do you follow faith or fear? Do you follow God? Do you plead or do you panic? Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that in times of difficulty we can still run to you, we can still hear from you. Lord, I pray you'd search our hearts. Lord, there are times, especially times right now, that we're tempted to worry, to fret. Lord, that's not faith. That's fear. 